and is meaning for you in terms of how happiness can come about through right view. Uh, so I have a sutta here today, and for the sake of the recording, um, I'll let you know what the sutta is. So it's from the Majjhima Nikaya, number 117, 117. It is the Maha Chatta Sutta, okay, which in translation into English roughly is the Great Forty. So 40 elements or 40 aspects in this particular sutta. So let's make a start and see where it takes us. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Which means homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully awakened one. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jetta's Grove, Anattapindika's Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus, which means the monks. Bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this. Bhikkhus, I shall teach you noble right concentration with its supports and its requisites. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir. The bhikkhus replied. The Blessed One said this. What bhikkhus is noble right concentration with its supports and its requisites? That is, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, and right mindfulness. Unification of mind equipped with these seven factors is called noble right concentration with its supports and its requisites. Therein, bhikkhus, Right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong view as wrong view and right view as right view. This is one's right view. And what bhikkhus is wrong view? There is nothing given, nothing offered, nothing sacrificed, no fruit or result of good and bad actions. No this world, no other world, no mother, no father, no beings who are reborn spontaneously, no good and virtuous recluses and brahmins in the world who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world. This is wrong view. And what bhikkhus is right view? Right view, I say, is twofold. There is right view that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in acquisitions. And there is right view that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path. And what bhikkhus is right view that is aff- affected by the taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions? There is what is given and what is offered and what is sacrificed. There is fruit and result of good and bad actions. There is this world and the other world. There is mother and father. There are beings who are reborn spontaneously. There are in the world good and virtuous recluses and brahmins who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world. This is right view affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. And what bhikkhus is right view that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path? The wisdom, the faculty of wisdom, the power of wisdom, the investigation of states, enlightenment factor, the path factor of right view, in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who's po- who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. This is right view that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path. One makes an effort to abandon wrong view and to enter upon right view. This is one's right effort. Mindfully, one abandons wrong view. Mindfully, one enters upon and abides in right view. This is one's right mindfulness. Thus, these three states run and circle around right view. That is, right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. Therein, bhikkhus, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong intention as wrong intention and right intention as right intention. This is one's right view. And what bhikkhus is wrong intention? The intention of sensual desire, the intention of ill will, and the intention of cruelty. This is wrong intention. And what bhikkhus is right intention? 
right intention, I say, is twofold. There is right intention that is affected by the taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. And there is right intention that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path. And what bhikkhus is right intention that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions, the intention of renunciation, the intention of non-ill will, and the intention of non-cruelty. This is right intention that is affected by taints and ripens in acquisitions. And what bhikkhus is right intention that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path. The thinking, thought, intention, mental absorption, mental fixity, directing of mind, verbal formation, in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path, this is right intention that is noble, a factor of the path. One makes an effort to abandon wrong intention and to enter upon right intention. This is one's right effort. Mindfully one abandons wrong intention, mindfully one enters upon and abides in right intention, this is one's right mindfulness. Thus, these three states run and circle around right intention, that is, right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. Therein because right view comes first, and how does right view come first? One understands wrong speech as wrong speech, and right speech as right speech. This is one's right view. And what because is wrong speech? False speech, malicious speech, harsh speech and gossip. This is wrong speech. And what because is right speech? Right speech, I say, is twofold. There is right speech that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions, and there is right speech that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path. And what because is right speech that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions? Abstinence from false speech, abstinence from malicious speech, abstinence from harsh speech, abstinence from gossip. And this is right speech that is affected by taints, ripening in the acquisitions. And what because is right speech that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path? The desisting from the four kinds of verbal misconduct, the abstaining, refraining, abstinence from them in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path, and is developing the noble path, this is right speech that is noble, a factor of the path. One makes an effort to abandon wrong speech and to enter upon right speech. This is one's right effort. Mindfully, one abandons wrong speech. Mindfully, one enters upon and abides in right speech. This is one's right mindfulness. Thus, these three states run and circle around right speech, that is, right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. Therein bhikkhus, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong action as wrong action and right action as right action. This is one's right view. And what bhikkhus is wrong action? Killing living beings, taking what is not given and misconduct in sensual pleasures. This is wrong action. And what bhikkhus is right action? Right action, I say, is twofold. There is right action that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. And there is right action that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path. And what because is right action that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. Abstinence from killing living beings, abstinence from taking what is not given, abstinence from misconduct in sensual pleasures. This is right action that is affected by taints, ripening in acquisitions. And what because is right action that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path. The desisting from the three kinds of bodily misconduct, the abstaining, refraining and abstinence from them in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. This is right action that is noble, a factor of the path. One makes the effort to abandon wrong action and to enter upon right action. This is one's right effort. Mindfully, one abandons wrong action. Mindfully, one enters upon and dwells in right action. This is one's right mindfulness. 
us these three states run and circle around right action, that is right view, right effort and right mindfulness. Therein because right view comes first, and how does right view come first? One understands wrong livelihood as wrong livelihood, and right livelihood as right livelihood. This is one's right view. And what because is wrong livelihood? Scheming, talking, hinting, belittling, pursuing gain with gain, this is wrong livelihood. And what because is right livelihood? Right livelihood, I say, is twofold. There is right livelihood that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. And there is right livelihood that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the par. And what bhikkhus is right livelihood that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions? Here, bhikkhus, a noble disciple, abandons wrong livelihood and gains his living by right livelihood. This is right livelihood that is affected by taints, ripening in acquisitions. And what bhikkhus is right livelihood that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path, the desisting from wrong livelihood, the abstaining, refraining, abstinence from it, in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path, this is right livelihood that is noble, a factor of the path. One makes an effort to abandon wrong livelihood and to enter upon right livelihood. This is one's right effort. Mindfully, one abandons wrong livelihood. Mindfully, one enters upon and dwells in right livelihood. This is one's right mindfulness. Thus, these three states run and circle around right livelihood, that is, right view, right effort, right mindfulness. Therein, bhikkhus, right view comes first, and how does right view come first? In one of right view, right intention comes into being. In one of right intention, right speech comes into being. In one of right speech, right action comes into being. In one of right action, right livelihood comes into being. In one of right livelihood, right effort comes into being. In one of right effort, right mindfulness comes into being. In one of right mindfulness, right concentration comes into being. In one of right concentration, right knowledge comes into being. In one of right knowledge, right deliverance comes into being. Thus, because the path of the disciple in higher training possesses eight factors, the arahant possesses ten factors. Therein, because right view comes first. And how does right view come first? In one of right view, wrong, live, a wrong view is, a, is abolished and the many evil unwholesome states that originate with wrong view as condition are also abolished. And the many wholesome states that originate with right view as condition come to fulfilment by development. In one of right intention, wrong intention is abolished and the many, unevil, many evil unwholesome states that originate with wrong intention as condition are also abolished. And the many wholesome states that originate with right intention as condition come to fulfillment by development. In one of right speech, wrong speech is abolished. In one of right action, wrong action is abolished. In one of right livelihood, wrong livelihood is abolished. In one of right effort, wrong effort is abolished. In one of right mindfulness, wrong mindfulness is abolished. In one of right concentration, wrong concentration is abolished. In one of right knowledge, wrong knowledge is abolished. In one of right deliverance, wrong deliverance is abolished. And the many evil, unwholesome states that originate with wrong deliverance as condition are also abolished. And the many wholesome states that originate with right deliverance as condition come to fulfillment by development. Thus, because there are 20 factors on the side of the wholesome and 20 factors on the side of the unwholesome, this Dhamma discourse on the Great Forty has been set rolling and cannot be stopped by any recluse or Brahmin or God or Mara or Brahma or anyone in the world. Because if any recluse or Brahmin thinks that this Dhamma discourse on the Great Forty should be censured and rejected, then there are ten legitimate deductions from his assertions that would prove grounds for censuring him here and now. If that worthy one censures right view, then he would honour and praise those recluses and Brahmins who are of wrong view. If that worthy one censures right intention, then he would honour and praise those recluses who's Bra and Brahmins who are of wrong intention. If that worthy one censures right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, right knowledge, right deliverance, then he would honour and praise those recluses and Brahmins who are of wrong deliverance. If any recluse or Brahmin thinks that this Dhamma discourse on the Great Forty should be censured and rejected, 
then these are the ten legitimate deductions from his assertions that would pro provide grounds for centering him here and now. Because even those teachers from Okala, Vasa and Banya who held the doctrine of non-causality, the doctrine of non-doing and the doctrine of nihilism, would not think that this Dhamma discourse on the Great Forty should be censured and rejected. Why is that? For fear of blame, attack and confutation. This is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <coughs> There's quite a lot in that sutta. I think much more than I can really realistically cover um, this morning. <coughs> probably three or four hours worth of discussion here. I'll try and condense as much as possible. So we come to uh, right view, the topic of the today's talk, of course, happiness through right view. But I thought it was important for us to have an understanding of what does right, what does right view represent or what does right view mean? Uh, and so here in, in the beginning with the, with the Buddha's talk on the view, what is, what is right view? And he stipulates that right view comes first. And sometimes people will get caught up in conversations with other people about um, extremes. They will say the Buddha's teaching is the middle way, the middle path. It doesn't have extremes. But there is right view and wrong view. So some would say that that's an extreme. It's like saying yes and no. right? But there is a view which is correct and there are views which are not correct. The views in line with the Dhamma and views which are not in line with the Dhamma. And you can't say, well, this is sort of in line with the Dhamma. There's no sort of. It either is or it isn't, right? It's, this is one of the f probably few occasions when there'll be a black and white response. Is this right view or wrong view? And so the Buddha goes into some depth here to explain what does right view represent. So it starts off, and a lot of, this, a lot of the time the Buddha talks in terms of negations uh, or maybe the, um, the opposite side, not necessarily one. Some would say positive versus negative is not quite, but... What is wrong view? So there is nothing given, nothing offered. At the time of the Buddha, there were religious people who had the view that there's no, nothing to be given or offered. In a, in a modern context, one might, as, uh, one might associate that with um, incorrect understanding of Zen philosophy. There, there is nothing, right? There is no body, there is no man, there is no woman, okay? Uh, so this, on an ultimate kind of... Um, uh, Dhamma level is correct for one who is possessed of right view already one could come to the um, assertion uh, this is this is true there is no such thing as a man or a woman it's just a label that you are using there is just the four elements plus consciousness in feeling and in intention and perception this is all that that is in front of me which I'm saying is a woman but it's not on an ultimate level that's true but it the Buddha is actually quite careful in the sutta to say that those who are of noble, noble view have this view. If you are yet to be of noble view, this is not the, this is a, a, a more of a mundane view that there is a man or there is a woman or a child or whatever. That's a mundane view to have that. It can be right mundane view. It's not right super mundane view. And to come to the conclusion of the supra mundane right view, which is noble, one has to have had the experience of seeing the Dhamma already, which, which means the first, at least, the first stage of enlightenment. So there's a lot of people who will go around and say, yeah, form is emptiness and emptiness is form, which is another way of saying, um, this is, there is no man and there is no woman. Okay, yes, that's great. Um, are you enlightened? Because unless you're enlightened, you actually don't understand form is emptiness and emptiness is form. It sounds good, it's good to use in cafes, um, as you're sipping on your <coughs> chai latte with a twist of lemon. <sighs> but let's just throw away talk, because really you don't understand it unless you've experienced it. And the Buddha talks about having penetrated this, having understood it, what that right view is. So th to this aspect of these eight factors in the Eightfold Path, the right view being the first of the Eightfold Path factors, there are the super mundane noble aspects, and then there are the, um, the what I would say, ordinary or mundane uh, aspects to this. And most of us will be working with the mundane aspects. So when we talk about things like morality, like sila, the precepts, etc., 
Um, when we look at what is right speech and wrong speech, we go through not being gossiping and not using harsh speech or false speech and stuff like this. But the quality of that changes for the noble ones. Um, it's the uh, absolute avoidance of any type of speech which, is, which, which, which could be considered harmful. No, it wouldn't just be to another, but also towards oneself. You might think that it's just about you not saying bad things about other people or gossip. But how about having the message about yourself in this way? I'm not worthy. I don't deserve happiness or peace. I'm not co competent or capable. I know I always stuff up. This, even this kind of speech, although you may not actually verbalize it, it is a type of speech. It's just not aspirated. It's not coming out of your mouth. But it is still a volition. It is still a, a speech within the mind. And that speech is harmful. Mostly because there's no self there to be the agent of these things anyway, which is why it's not noble speech. A noble one understands that there isn't anything here with which to, pr to praise or to blame. It's precisely the reason that the enlightened ones can be happy with right view. They're happy because there's nobody to blame. When they see somebody else, they may fight, okay, even if they're you know, at the stream entry level or whatever, they might fight with people, they might be angry, but ultimately they know underneath all of that stuff, which you will say is a man or a woman, it's actually empty. There's no real person there. There's no self, soul or spirit. There's no bunte jag underneath this facade it is just conditions arising and passing away it is just a perception which arises and passes away a feeling arising and passing away an intention arising and passing away consciousness arising and passing away it is a shell it's like it's like looking at a, a tornado you think it's substantial from the outside look at that black swirling air and dust and stuff but when you go into the center of it there's actually nothing there it looks like a solid funnel from the outside but on the inside it's hollow and the same kind of uh, process for us if we are not possessed of right view we will think i'm arguing with jeff i'm arguing with samantha and he was always like this He's always argumentative, domineering, trying to always win the arguments. But there actually isn't any Jeff. In a mundane sense, yes, but not in the super mundane. And because we take a mundane view, we get caught up in this identity. Jeff is always like this. We come up, sorry if uh, there are some Jeffs around here. <laughs> I don't know if there are any Jeffs in the audience. There probably is, but <laughs> too bad to be Jeff today. Don't take it personally. That would be mundane, wrong view, okay? <laughs> it's just an example. And it's because we take the mundane to be so true. We invest so much in this facade. We even put makeup on. We put perfume on. We spend spend years in the hairdressers, Botox, eyebrow tattoos, <laughs> plucking, of, plucking of hair between the eyebrows, ears, neck, throat, if you're unlucky, tongue, <laughs> body building, <laughs> body sculpting, um, being the, um, what do you call, gym junkie running for kilometers until you look like you're about to fall over if somebody was to cough. So lean. For what? It's for this external stuff, right? All external, it's not you. There's no you there anyway. There's just a changing process. But because we invest so much in this, we are prepared to fight for it. We're prepared to argue for it and we're prepared to win for it. We don't want to lose for it. So when we engage with another person in some conversation or some relationship, it can even be a superficial relationship. Upon first meeting, what do we do when we, what do we do when we first engage in a 
a meeting with somebody. Some of us will go with a greeting. Out comes the hand. But the game has started before your handshake even takes place. Already you have done a visual scan. Now, maybe that the person starts talking. So they talk with a voice like this. You've already started making an assessment about this person. This person's clearly crazy. Who would have such a whiny voice like that? It's irritating. Already you've come up with a whole laundry list of problems. Right? You might say it sounds like a Simpsons character. It might start making you laugh. But the other person may not like that. They may think, oh, why is this person laughing? I haven't even really said much yet. <laughs> I haven't had any political or religious views coming out. But we already make that assessment upon first meeting somebody. And because we go usually into the mundane, not the super mundane, we go into the mundane aspects of that interaction, we get brought down, we get caught up. It's like we're getting running into bushes of thorns. Every which way you turn, you get caught. Because it's not looking at that situation with super mundane right view. Actually, there isn't a man or a woman or a child there. There's no makeup. There's no bodybuilding. It's just changing form. It's not me. It's not mine. It's not self. And if it's not me, not mine, and not self, for that being, it is also not theirs, not them, not themselves. In the same way, if we can see it for ourselves, we will see it for others. But if we cannot see it for ourselves, we cannot see this in others, this quality. And if we can see this quality, it will lead more and more to your happiness and well-being. How many times do you find yourself getting stressed and worried about a situation that you usually cannot control? Most situations, actually, you can't control. You can influence minor or lesser or greater, but you cannot have 100% control over anything in this world because of its nature to change, its impermanence. doesn't allow you to control. Even your own body, if you think it's yours, how many of you would be sick? I certainly wouldn't be sitting here this morning with fever and headache trying to talk to you if I thought I had control over this body. I just say, no, sickness is not allowed, no sickness today. And it should change if I have control, but I don't. These are conditions. The dry throat, the cough, the headaches, the husband. These are all conditions which arise and pass away. Okay? You don't have any... How many of you think you have control over your wives? Or husbands? Or, f or friends? You want to go to a movie, but your friend says, sounds like rubbish. I don't think I want to go to that one. Let's go to this one. And then you say, sounds like rubbish. <laughs> and this is the mundane way of looking at things. And through that mundane view, of course, non-happiness arises. So happiness comes when you start to understand more. Actually, there is no me, there's no self, there's no I here. This is having a right view. And I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to argue and resist it's this resistance which is the issue. You see, the fight doesn't come first. It's the mental quality of resistance. Think about it. Think about it. Freedom fighters. Do they start fighting without any resistance coming first? Where does the resistance come from? In a mundane world, usually the resistance is ideological or political or religious, right? First comes the resistance of a view about a situation. Then comes the physical actions and speeches. It can be political speeches, religious speeches, and then physical violence later on. It's an escalation, but it's based on resistance. And what is that resistance? It is simply not seeing things as they really are. You want to change it to something which is more favourable to you. Usually... This is about more favourable for your sensual pleasures, your craving, or your delusion, or your anger. The three taints, which takes any view and makes it a wrong view. 
which takes any action and makes it a wrong action. So we need to resist the aspects of greed, hatred and delusion. Not resist how things actually are. Things as they are is actually just fine and dandy. But it's when we come into the situation and want to start changing that. I want to change my wife. I want to change my son. I want to change my job. I want to change the people who are considered my friends. I want to change the country. I want to change my house. If you found it's okay just as it is, whatever the condition is, you will find happiness will come into your mind. Not depression. Depression comes because you want to change something, but you can't. Or you feel powerless to change. That's where depression comes. A hopelessness. I can't affect the changes that I want. I'm thin and I want to put on weight and I can't. For whatever reason, you feel depressed about it. You can't get the exam results you think you should get. You get depressed about it. Because you don't believe you have the power to change that. We need to move more towards an acceptance of the situation for what it actually is. An acceptance. Now, it's different to agreeing with something. You may not agree with something. That's fine. But you do need to accept it. I may not agree that my low marks at university will be sufficient for me to graduate. But being the reality as it is, I need to accept it. If you don't accept it, then this is where our suffering comes in. Happiness comes from acceptance. If I can accept another person for who they are, then I can be happy. If I can accept myself, warts and all, all the good qualities, which I also have, if I can accept them, then I will also feel happiness. It's not a case of trying to change everything about yourself and then saying, I accept that. This is the basis of greed. Greed is, I will accept anything which is good. I will not accept that which is bad or not favorable to me or my circumstances. That's called greed. Renunciation is the opposite. It's about saying, I can accept this as it really is. This is a particular situation and I can accept that. Having said that, if you're in a situation which is causing harm to yourself or harm to another or harm to both, you have to make a decision. Are you prepared to stay with that, which will likely, unless you're fully enlightened, <laughs> lead to you having bad thoughts or bad speech or bad action? Just for yourself, let alone for the other. Or are you thinking, okay, I know my strengths and I know my weaknesses. This is not the ground on which I should start a battle. Because what will happen in that battle? Sometimes people will say to you, you should fight for your rights. I will tell you, you only have one right in this world. There's no such thing as human rights. Although the UN says that there's human rights, that's an organization, it's a theory. With birth as condition, you have the right to die. That is your right. Because all of you have that. H human rights apply to people in certain countries. Not all countries. Certain towns. Not all towns. If it was a human right, you would all possess it. It would be a human right to be free from poverty. But guess what? Ah, important messages are coming through from the UN. <laughs> Ante Jag, you're right. I'm a lawyer for the UN, and you'd be surprised how many countries don't get the aid that they need. No, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised at all. <laughs> because it's not a human right. If it was a human right, you would be possessed. Everyone would have it. So that's why I say, with birth as condition, you have the human right to die. And you will die. All of you. Even people in YouTube land will also die. Okay? That's a right. But we have expectations. We expect others to behave in a certain way that accords with how we like to behave. And sometimes not even how we like to behave, because that's called a double standard. <laughs> I would like you to behave a certain way. I really don't behave that way myself, but you should behave that way. Do as I say, not as I do. 
That's where that concept comes from. And this is about expectations, about a desire for others to do something other than what they actually are doing. And when we resist, and the resistance is, it starts off as a thought, it's not action of body, but when we resist that understanding, we resist the knowing something for what it really is. When we resist that, that is when we encounter dukkha, dissatisfaction or suffering. When we accept, when we accept something for what it actually is, because we understand it with right view, we have no problem. The Buddha uses a simile, even if bandits were to hold you down arm by arm and cut your arms and legs off with a saw, if you give rise to the mind of anger during that process, you are not practicing the Dhamma. How many of us, when we see uh, any depictions of violence, especially if it's terrorist acts or something like this, how many of us feel upset and angry just watching it and it's not even us, it's not even a friend, maybe not even somebody from your own country? How many of us get upset by seeing that, let alone if it was you who were the, act the actual person being the subject of that violence? It is very difficult, very difficult not to be moved by such things. But that's because we're getting sucked into the drama, you see. Am I saying that those acts of violence are good? No, not at all. Am I condoning it? Not at all. What I'm not condoning is being sucked into the drama. You already are caught in the play of I and them. Me, mine and I. Just as I think I have my body, my health, my rights, I think they have the same. You've started identifying with something which is not true. You're looking into the middle of the hurricane and seeing something substantial which just isn't there. You're in the eye of the storm and you think it's where all the action is. You're misunderstanding the situation. How often do we inject ourselves into other people's business thinking that we're actually going to be helping the situation where we actually end up making it more difficult and complicated. Sometimes the best thing is just to stand still. Whilst the storm is raging around you, it is sometimes best just to stand still. Because when you're moving too quickly and thinking too much, how reliable are your thoughts? How reliable are these perceptions arising and passing away? How reliable is consciousness? Memory is so unreliable. How many of us get into arguments? Oh, you said that last week. No, I didn't. I said this. Ah, it's rubbish. How many times do you have in your mind the thought, if only I had a tape recorder and I recorded that guy? All right? Yeah, you reckon you said this, but I play it back to you. <laughs> but the problem is, just as memory is unreliable for them, it's unreliable for you as well. It's unreliable for me. I've seen that so many times in my own life, how my memory is not reliable. And I would love to think it is. I take pride in it sometimes. But that pride, you know, just before the fall. All right? That memory is thoroughly unreliable. We're taking stock, we're taking our faith and our confidence on something which is changing. Your brain changes second by second. Your quality of memory is changing in the same way. Unless you're free from defilements, your memory is likely to be clouded. Clouded with greed, clouded with anger, clouded with delusion. These are the taints. It's like looking through a lens. But in this case, it's three lenses. You've got three lenses. Greed, hatred, and delusion. So whenever you look through that, whatever you see is distorted on the other side. It's not clear. It's not accurate. Because the taints, their function is to distort. And that's what they do. They distort. What you see to be true or reality is actually not that. It requires that suppression of the taints, which is what the jhana is for, the meditation, is to suppress the stillness and peace of the mind suppresses temporarily enough for you to see through no greed, hatred or delusion lens.
Some of you may have thought that was a car horn. Already getting caught up with the delusion of the idea of a car. Okay, it was just a sound. It came and went away. But even just in such an example as that, I didn't line that up either. <laughs> if so, they got great timing. Uh, <laughs> when we look into these kinds of things, when we, we have an experience of a stimulus in our environment, do we make more of it? Is it just that or do we add more to it? And typically we add more to what is our current experience. Our current experience is not just what's happening, but it's our way of remembering things in the past which was like that thing. And here comes the distortions, right? You go back to the past, looking in the history, already starting to distort the present moment experience. Just to look in the here and the now and be present is difficult enough. Trying to add reflections from the past. Oh, I know a person who used to look like this. I know a person who used to talk like that, act like that. Then you start to use your database of past experiences thinking that this particular experience will be just like that. Oh, when this type of monk comes in looking like this, he's going to give this kind of talk. This is how we think. But that's not right view. That's not seeing something for what it really is. Not being in the present moment. Not at all. We're off into the past or into the future looking for the next phone call that we need to answer. The SMS response to that phone call or whatever it is. Already our minds have spiralled off. When we're sitting with somebody, are we actually present with them? You want happiness in your life? Then we need to be more present with the people that we interact with. When somebody is in front of you, are you already starting to line up your answers before they've even finished their statement? How many of us get caught up in that? I've got to fire off a quick response. As soon as they, as soon as they finish, bang. And I'm guilty of that a lot of the time. Trying to forecast what other people think, forecast what their meaning is. I'm overlaying my views, my opinions, my requirements over the top of somebody else's before they've even let, let it be clear what their a, opinion or view or re need or requirement is. How many of us fall into that trap every day, forecasting other people's requirements without actually asking what the requirements are? You want to have good relationships with people? You want to be happy? Stop becoming gypsies. There's no room for the crystal ball. If crystal balls were accurate, gypsies wouldn't be poor. Right? Think about it. Gypsies are running around without their own homes, in wagons, trying to make ends meet. Well, if your crystal ball was accurate, you'd only need one lotto ticket, wouldn't you? You don't need to travel across the countryside. You just beg. You can beg in the street for a few dollars, go and buy a ticket, sit back and wait for the millions to come in. If looking into the future was accurate. But it's not. Otherwise, fortune tellers would be wealthy and there wouldn't be fortune tellers anymore. They'd just be enjoying their wealth. And they certainly wouldn't want to share the first division with all the rest of you. <laughs> so they're not going to tell you the truth anyway. <laughs> they want it all for themselves. But that's not true. They can't see the future 100% accurate. So we can't also, when we're dealing with another person, we can't also see 100% accurate. What we take to be another person is already a lie. So we need to back away from that and come back to the present moment. What is happening here and now? And be with that person, what they're saying and what they're doing and trying to understand what they're saying. You may hear it, but it doesn't mean to say that you're actually listening to it. Even if you listen, it doesn't mean it goes to understanding. It's a deeper process. I can listen to you, but I may not really understand you. I can hear you, which means I'm not actually paying much attention whatsoever. It's just sound like the car horn as I'm talking. I recognize there's a sound, but I'm actually not giving much attention to it. Why is that? I'm not asking. Why is that horn blowing? Is somebody parked in the driveway, obscuring their way? They can't get out? Are they waiting for a friend to come out of the house? Is that directed to us? I'm not going into that detail. That's called hearing. When I go to that next step, being more investigative about that process, this is listening. But it not. I haven't yet come to understanding. Understanding takes that next step. 
What does my heart feel? Or what does that, that person's heart feel about this situation? You have your gut instinct as well, right? Or the heart, or you're interchangeable. So whilst you might be listening to something and you can know the details, do you actually understand the mind behind it, the intentions behind it? Maybe the intentions aren't clear, requires more research, requires looking into it more deeply. But all too often we get caught up with rushing around, haven't got time for this, haven't got time for that. We're like a spinning top. You know when you spin, the, I don't know if the kids have those toys anymore, but when I was a kid we had spinning tops. You press it down, it spins very quickly. Now, what do you see when you see a spinning top? You just see emotion, or well, usually just white. When you mix all the colours together, you get white. But when that top, that top starts to slow down, you can see colours more clearly. And when it slows right down and it stops, you can actually see the patterns. Oh, there's a picture of a teddy bear there and a rainbow, and a beach ball. But you can't see any of that detail when it's spinning so quickly. Our minds are like the tops. The faster they spin, the less we actually understand and see. If you want happiness in your life, allow that top to slow down. The slower it is, the more you will understand. If it can stop, you understand even more. That's when you get deliverance, freedom from greed, hatred and delusion. When that stops, that mind is stopping, clarity comes. When you see things clearly, then you can understand and that's when the deliverance from suffering comes. That's true happiness. Seeing, being able to see that top stop. That rhymed. It was meant to be. Okay, this is my talk on how right view can lead towards happiness this morning. I offer that for your reflection and contemplation and open for any questions and answers. Uh, well, hopefully there's questions. Um, yes? Are we passing the microphone around? Um, it's not working, but it's it is working, it's just not to your mouth. <laughs> but it's just for, is this going to the recording? Oh, I see. Does the microphone go into the recording? Oh, okay. Um, I don't know if they're going to get the microphone around to you. Okay, sorry, you, let's go for your question, yes. Yes, right view means you understand the Four Noble Truths. Not just um, having a, accepted reflectant, a reflective acceptance sorry, on it, but actually knowing through direct experience and that happens at stream entry. Understanding the Four Noble Truths starts at stream entry. It's refined completely at Arahantship. Yep. Yes? Mm. in that contemplation meditation. Would the, the, be the two extra qualities would be uh, the, uh, the elements of the enlightenment? Yes, that, that was factors 9 and 10 to see. Um, I'll, just, I'll just find it first. Yeah. Wisdom is, um, I think wisdom is applied knowledge from my understanding. Like you can know something, but knowing it and then knowing what to do with it is a different thing. And I think wisdom is the application of one's intelligence or knowledge in the right time, in the right place. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to split hairs too much over wisdom and knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, knowledge. Yes. to find that part there yeah but there's the um the um, noble noble one can be on the eight factors which is the um right view right through to right um concentration that's that's just for the noble one but for the arahant they have 
uh, right deliverance and right knowledge of deliverance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Merits and acquisitions, yes. Yep. Yep. Um, okay, so uh, a right view, I say, is twofold. There is right view that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. See, acquisitions means birth. Yeah, so th th that's the part you're talking about. Yep. So ripening in acquisition means birth in any kind of realm. You're acquiring. So you think when people say you do good things and you have a good birth, right? So this is the merits, partaking of the merit, right? So you're, um, for example, you're helping somebody across the road who's, you know, needs some assistance. You help them across the road. You think it's a good thing to do. You've got right, it's a good intention. Although mundane, it is a mundane one. You're not thinking I'm going to, you know. Yes. We need help, right? Yes. We need karma if we need an acquisition. We need birth. Arahants don't have that kind of acquisition because they have cut off the birth aspect. There's no more karma for them which would lead to birth. So they don't create birth creating karma anymore. They do, they do have good karma in terms of creating because of right action, right speech, etc. So... Um, the karma that they will have is good, but it will not r not be realised as an acquisition. Uh, in other words, not be realised as a birth in the future, be because they don't have any craving, which is the requisite for an acquisition to take place. Does that make sense? Or what we do here is make an acquisition. Acquisition. What we do here is it, leading to make an acquisition. It will. Uh, it depends, though. Want you? I, I. I. I would. I would have to be careful because some of you might be sitting there. Going into a deeper meditation, based upon what you've been hearing, the chanting can start you off, right? Sometimes the chanting will start to f make the mind feel very peaceful, right? And then going into that, you start to listen to some talk, and then you might actually go into the Dhamma. Th an example of that is actually in the, in the um, suttas, where you see um, Venerable, well, before he was Venerable Sariputta, seeing Venerable Asaji walking into town. One of the Arahant monks, the first Arahant monks, after the Buddha taught the five ascetics, he was one of the first five, walking into town for alms round, and, Venerable, and Sariputta says, ah, oh, this, surely somebody like this sort of is, is um, advanced in their practice. Look at them, they, their sense restraint is so strong. They look focused and happy or peaceful. I shall ask him some questions. And he went over and approached him. And then the Venerable Saji said to him, whatever is of the nature to arise is of the nature to pass away. Because of course, Sariputta was asking, when you tell me about your teacher. And that two sentences, whatever is of the nature to arise, this is also of the nature to pass away. And then that's when Venerable Sariputta, he wasn't a venerable at that point, but that's when Sariputta actually became a stream enterer mm. on hearing an aspect of the Dhamma. So can I say that there's nobody actually in this audience who is going into the more the super mundane thing? I can't say that um, maybe one, there's one or two of you in there who, who is I don't know right could have a Sariputra experience and I, I wouldn't know about it right it's not like there's a neon sign that says got it <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you might think it's the people who get up early and leave right <laughs> that's all right got what I need okay I'm off <laughs> so yes it can be it can be mundane or super mundane it depends upon your intention if it's wrong intention or right intention Okay, if your intention is towards renunciation, towards release, then having that as right intention, okay, release as in right intention, whatever is said could be transformative in that way in that it goes super mundane rather than mundane. Does that make sense? Okay, you may not agree with it, but do accept it. <laughs> I was just having a bit of fun. You may not agree with it, but do you accept that? Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Um, is that actually strong and immeasurable is the path from not the worldly wisdom knowledge that the Kalamu has, 
is the knowledge in the noble eightfold path the worldly not, not, the, worldly not the worldly wisdom the, uh, uh, ah, well to answer that question i think from the sutta itself there is the mundane and then there's also the super mundane so there is aspects of the eightfold path which are um, wholesome but doesn't necessarily lead to enlightenment and then there's that which is wholesome and leads to enlightenment so you can be um, saying something nice to another person um, uh, oh that's um, that's a good job you did there in the garden you really it's uh, very well weeded and you've got some nice flowers growing there now you, you put a lot of effort into that if your intention is directed w towards making them feel happy about themselves right maybe that's wholesome but it's also bound up in birth again, right? You're creating identity, whose garden, how nice that is and stuff. Right, Arahants now go running around talking to each other saying, oh, you look amazing today, oh, thank you, so do you. It's like, they're beyond that, right? Even though it's not unpleasant speech, it's not aimed at making somebody feel bad, it, it's, not, they're, they're, it's, it's not aiming at something very high, it's aiming at something quite worldly. So in this particular sutta, you see that there's two aspects. It's twofold, the mundane aspects and then the super mundane. Yeah. Does it make, okay, make sense? Okay. A question, hang on. How do you use right view in meditation? Uh, by f when uh, the Buddha says here that there are these three aspects circling around each other, um, well, no, well, not so much merit, but right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. These three factors support right concentration, which is the meditation. Right. Another way I define, I define, I can't say I found this in the suttas, but this is how I explain it. The function of right mindfulness is to protect the other aspects of the Eightfold Path. Right? It's like a guiding light. Yeah, it's like steering things, right? And, and that includes balance, getting things into balance. Um, so when talking about you know right intention, right speech, right action, if you've got mindfulness there, and it has to be with uh, the Buddha says here, uh, I'm going to go with what he says, not with what I say, right? Um, when he's got here, um, those three factors are, are circling around each other. That is right view, right effort, right mind, right mindfulness. These are balancing each other out. You need all three in order to know if your practice is going the right way or not. Right, so you might be putting in um, right effort and right mindfulness, but it can't be right effort or right mi mindfulness without right view. Right view is like mum and dad guiding the kids, right? Hopefully, yes. So it's like a supervisor, but without right view, it won't be right effort or right mindfulness. Right. So right view, and the Buddha says this: right view comes first. But you won't perfect right view; it won't be pure until. Greed, hatred, and delusion is disappeared completely. Only then can you see perfectly clear. But it's it's enough. It's enough to see what is nibbana, what is not nibbana, which is what a stream enterer will do. One who is on the first stage of enlightenment understands no self. It's enough to understand no self, then to make the movement towards not getting caught up with the conceits of what is this in relation to this, which is what the anagami has to make go of. What is that in relation to this? There's still a conceit, I am. They know there's no self, but they still get caught up with the idea of what is that in relation to this? This is one of the last things to go uh, along with restlessness for the anagami. Does that, make, does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. So uh, just to repeat what you're saying, the, the Buddha says, you're saying, the Buddha says in many places where the, uh, the little super mundane action that you do is w much stronger, or much more powerful maybe than the mundane. However, I will add to that and say without a good basis of mundane, the super mundane is not possible. It cannot. Yeah. It's the, it's the flower bed. The, the mundane good actions, right action, right speech, right livelihood, the mundane aspect of this is a necessary component for the development of the super mundane, even the smallest seed which goes into the garden 
of super mundane can't arise without that basis of right action, right speech, right livelihood. Yes. Mm. Being really aware of the condition. The mundane aspect of looking at the condition side of things, it's it's true. You you, you can't arrive at um at the right non-self. that non self without understanding. understanding the current conditions. Yes. So the current conditions is one thing. The right concentration which comes at the end of the eightfold path. It's the it's the process of the meditation itself which shows you actually when the mind is so peaceful, there is no room for an agent. There is no room for a self. It, it's, not, it's not evidenced. It's not experienced in any way. And that is what shakes you from the wrong view. I am. There is a me. There is a self. That is the thing which shakes your worldview completely. Once that happens, there is no going back. It's like if you've been exposed to the Roswell files. You've been exposed to the Kennedy assassination reports that were being hidden, right? And once you open the folder, it's not possible for you to say, I don't know the truth anymore. You know it and you can't go back with the wrong view, even as much as you would like to, but you wouldn't because you understand how things actually are. You can't go, there's no reverse gear. It, it, might, it might only be stuck in first, but it will still crawl forward from that point onwards. Once you make that breakthrough in the Dhamma, our hunship is guaranteed. Yes. It could be slow, it could be quick. Yeah. Um, I think this is comparing with the mental process. So what if someone says, oh, I'm convicted in my mind state. There's no need for me to meditate anymore. <laughs> It may, for the deluded person, it's not an oxymoron. Uh, as you've got to look at the actions of body and speech to be, as an indicator to see has this person actually arrived at the destination. The Buddha is critical of monks, or anybody else for that matter, who, th who sits content with stream entry, the first stage of enlightenment, and people think, oh, that's good enough. Really? Have you eliminated birth? You haven't, so birth is suffering. The Buddha says very clearly, birth is suffering. Aging is suffering. Sickness is suffering. Death is suffering. Why would the Buddha say you should be content with that? And he doesn't. He says you have more work to do. So for those who say, uh, I have right view, uh, it's good enough what I'm doing, they can be content with that, but what they're content with is the, back, the fact that they're standing at the front of the house, but they can't see the back of the house burning, and they're content with that. Oh, you know, Bhante, I'm very content with that. I'll say, well, look, I mean, contentedness is a nice quality, but the back of your house is still burning. Oh, no, I don't need to do anything. Well, that's between you and your insurance company. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not, nothing that it would be. So that there's a lack of understanding. There's a lack of wisdom there, yeah. A lack of insight into the nature of how things really are. Yes. We're content with things usually when we don't know all sides of the story. We can be easily contented with reading just the face of the magazine until we go into the pages, into the depth of it. We actually don't know what's underneath. Although the cover looks just fantastic and we'll buy it. Right? And we'll get the next issue until we read the contents. We go, oh, it's different from what I thought it was going to be. Okay. <laughs>